So before we get started on assembling our kit, we wanna make sure that we get the right tools around for the job. I'm coming to you now having finished my kit and on my bench here I have all the tools that I used to assemble the kit. So we're gonna go through kind of from start to finish each of the tools and tool groups that you might need to assemble your traditions St. Louis Hawken kit. A lot of this varies depending on what you wanna do and the kind of looks that you wanna get from your kit. Um, you can really just kind of get away with some sandpaper, some files, and maybe a couple chisels and stain and oil and you're ready to go. Uh, we went a little more in depth with this kit and so the tools are gonna reflect that a little bit. If you don't have some of the options that we have here laid out, there are plenty of alternatives and affordable options out there to get you started. But most of this stuff is kind of beginner introductory woodworking and gunsmithing tools. I think probably the most expensive items on the bench are either the heat gun or the can of stain, which neither are one use items. So keep that in mind, this is an affordable kit and the tools that you're gonna use for it are gonna be affordable as well. So starting out, the main tools that we're gonna be using are files and a little bit of chisel work. Now the files that I'm using, I have this large kind of rough, it's probably part way between a file and a rasp. This is an old Nicholson file, uh, but this is just kind of a coarse, large file for removing a lot of wood fast. This is gonna be a lot faster than trying to sand or uh, grind anything away. And it's gonna be a lot safer because we can only move so much so fast. Uh, the neat thing about this file here on the side is it has a totally clean edge. So I can get this right up against an inlet or a curve on the stock and I know that I'm not going to you know, take away wood where I don't wanna be. Going from rough to fine, Next up is this kind of coarse half round file. This is good for getting into the areas around inlets and around curves that the large flat file can't get into. And then when we're trying to take away less and less, we're gonna get down and start using a pretty fine file. So this is what I call kind of my medium file for this project. It's another half round. I like using the half rounds for this kit because it's a nice middle ground to be able to flip back and forth depending on what I'm using without stopping and picking up another file. So this one, you can, you can see the teeth there. The most fine file that I'm gonna use is this little half round guy here. This is probably the file that I use the most across this entire project just because of its size and how fine it is. I mean, feeling this, it's just about the same roughness as a coarse sandpaper. Um, so it really became my go-to file for this project. We can see here, it's about four and a half inches long. This was just a really, <laughs> really good file for, for this project. So I, I encourage you to check out and try to get a kind of a small file like this one for those little just touch up parts of the project. The last file that I have is a pretty special file. Um, I don't imagine that you have one of these unless you've done a lot of dovetail work, um, but this is a dovetail file. And it's called that because it's triangular in shape, but it has two clean sides, like this large file here. And this allowed me to get into the metal dovetails for the, like the barrel lug or for the sights and lets me adjust those dovetails and the sights to make sure they fit properly. So this is really the only specialty file that we have for this project. I really recommend for ha having one of these just around the shop. It's really handy to have these two clean sides just to be able to work something at an angle. A pair of pliers is gonna be nice. I mentioned a couple chisels and a small knife. So these are some little palm chisels that I have around the shop. Both of these are just differing radiuses. One is pretty shallow and the other one's pretty steep. The only place where you're gonna use these is if you have any spots where you might need to do some inletting. For me, the trigger guard was a little, needed a little work and that was about it. So having a couple pair of rounded, you know, curved chisels like this can really help make that inletting easier. This really small knife blade was, is also gonna be used for any inletting. This is nice because it allows you to trace a part onto the wood stock and know exactly where you need to you know, cut a line or extend your inletting. Using a pencil, you can do that as well, but it's not gonna be as close to where the actual inlet needs to be as this is. I mean, this is a really thin, narrow knife, kind of like an X-Acto blade. And that's what we're shooting for with here is just a nice thin blade that we can go around parts with to make sure that we're not inletting too much and removing too much wood. 
For general assembly and disassembly, all the screws on this project are flatheads. So I've just got a small, this is an eighth by three inch flathead, and this is a 3 16 by four inches. Just a couple screwdrivers. Uh, the small one's good for a couple of the kind of ornate screws. And this is the, the 3 16 is really the, the screwdriver you're gonna use on this project. Um, the small one is really handy for popping parts in and out of their inlets safely. So I recommend at least having the small one around for things like that. We're gonna need some sandpaper. Now, the finish and quality of sandpaper that you wanna use is really up to you. I started with this heavy sandpaper, and this is probably 150 grit, 180 grit was my real rough sandpaper. I then bumped up to a 240 grit. You can see here, all these pieces are pretty worn out. I like them being worn out because it's easier to work around bends and things in the wood. Um, it's, and it just makes it a lot smoother. And then my max when it came to sandpaper was this 400 grit sandpaper. This is as far as I went when it came to sanding parts and wood. You can take it up higher. A lot of people will take things up to about a thousand grit with their sandpaper. But from what I've read, when you get to about 800, it starts to you know, be questionable of whether or not you can tell. And if this is your first muzzle loader and the first kit that you're assembling, 400 grit is gonna be more than enough to get you a nice finish. On top of the sandpaper, you're gonna see I'm gonna use a buffing wheel with some buffing compound a little bit. That is by no means something that you have to do. Um, and if you don't have a buffing wheel, I recommend getting a hold of just the fabric wheel and hooking it onto a power drill and using the buffing compound and the buffing wheel, just as I'm going to do on the stationary buffing wheel to get a uniform look on things. As a finish to any sanding and polishing that I'm gonna do, I'm using just a beetle old piece of Scotch-Brite. Uh, there are a ton of colors out on the market. A lot of times you're gonna see it in green. I just have some extra here in the shop that's just this red. This is what I consider to be kind of a magic tool. This can take a part that you're kind of worried about it looking good enough and really polishes it up nice, gets it looking good without a whole lot of effort. So from the 180 grit sandpaper to 240 to 400 and then to your Scotch-Brite, for just about everything that you're gonna do on this kit, this is gonna be plenty and it's gonna really make it easy to get a nice finish. I also have just some household oil here. There's a couple threads that Traditions recommends oiling before you seat them. It's gonna make it easier to take them off in the future if you ever need to replace something like the nipple. For marking screw holes, it, you can't beat having just a this little push all like this. You can use a drill or um, a hand drill, but I really recommend the simplicity of the awl. You don't need to worry about drilling too much or removing too much material. You just push this into your wood, give it a little tap, and you're good to go. You've got a nice little hole started for your screws and you don't have to worry about anything splitting. I've got this plastic non-marring rubber mallet. This is real handy for seeding things and working with things just all around. Um, this way we weren't denting or nicking any of our hardware. I've also got this ball peen hammer with a wood handle. You're gonna use both ends of this depending on what you need to do with your kit, but it's just real handy to have around. When you get down to preparing your stock for stain and oil, uh, it's recommended that you do what's called whiskering. We'll go over that in a future video, but to do that, you're gonna need a heat gun of some kind. I mean, this if you don't have a heat gun like this in your shop, you can use a powerful hair dryer. It's just gonna take a little bit longer, but this is something that's nice to have, especially if you're planning on building more kits over time. As we start talking about finishes that are gonna alter the surface of metal, it's really important that we're doing this safely. So I recommend having a few pairs of just latex gloves around. A lot of this stuff you don't want to have long-term exposure on your skin with. And along with this eye protection, this is gonna keep any splatter, anything away from your important eyes. So be sure you have some safety equipment around when we start handling some of these finishing chemicals. And the two chemicals that we're gonna be using are brass black and cold blue. Now there are all sorts of brands of these out there and it's all up to personal preference. These are the two that I had in my shop. This is Casey Brass Black. It's been around for a super long time. And this is Brownell's Oxfo Blue. So each of these are, 
I think there's the tags on them, eleven fifteen and eleven dollars for these. And these are nice. You're going to use a very limited amount with each kit that you assemble. So these bottles like this size are going to last quite a long time. Along with the chemicals, you're going to want to have a couple small, just cheap containers that you can pour chemicals into or pour water into. Um, a lot of these chemicals you don't want to pour or pull directly from the bottle itself. You're going to pour extra into one of these, use it, and then you dispose of it. So having a couple of these around, I've actually got another one over here filled with water just for cleaning anything up. So these are handy to have around. With the finishing chemicals that we're talking about, it's going to be handy to have some cotton swabs at your bench too. These are an easy disposable little brush. That you don't have to worry about contamination with your chemical bottles. So having a few Q-tips around can't hurt. Next, you're going to need some wood stain and a brush. This is really up to you uh, as to what kind of stain that you have. It's really handy if, like me, you have a shop with several stains already in it from other projects. Um, but if not, and if you can afford it, it's good to grab a couple different colors of stain because you're not going to be sure how the stain that you've picked will react with your specific stock. So even though this is a Verathane gun stock wood stain, they call it, the color that I get on my stock might be different than the color that you get on your stock. I've just got a cheap hardware brush here to apply it, and that's what we'll need for stain. Between staining and oiling, you have the optional step of going through and hitting it again with your Scotch-Brite. You can also use a piece of antler to do what we're going to show you called burnishing. This is just going to be a simple treatment to the wood to give us a varied surface in comparison to just plain stain. After you stain your stock, you're going to want to apply some oil. I'm using some Watco Danish finish oil. It's a real simple oil. It's a real nice oil. Oftentimes it's referred to as linseed oil. I'm not sure if this is specifically linseed oil, but it is very similar in composition and final look that you get. Something I forgot about using is this vise here. I've got it mounted on a board that locks into another vise on my bench here, but this is just a really handy turning vise to use when building one of these kits. Inside the jaw here, I've got a swivel jaw set up. So this is just a curved piece of wood. I've got a couple magnets in here to hold it to the vise, but that lets me grip things that aren't straight, which just about nothing on this gun is straight, especially um, we're going to use this vise a lot for the stock. So having a swivel jaw set up in there is going to be real handy for you. You don't have to have a high dollar expensive vise. You can go down to Harbor Freight or Lowe's and get something that'll get you through this kit. But I'll tell you that having a nice quality vise will pay for itself hand over fist over the years. So that's the vise I've got. And I've, I use a couple other vices in the video, but this is the main one. It'll also be nice to have some shop rags around the bench, just something that you can clean up a mess or wipe down some oil real fast and get it out of your way so you don't have any you know, spill mishaps or anything. And that's pretty much it. That's everything that I used on this kit. Um, if you don't have everything, feel free to get started with what you have and assemble tools and pieces as you can. In the next video, we'll be starting assembly, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. And also visit nmlra.org slash Craftsman's Corner. We're going to have a series of write-ups about this build along with the tools that we're using. So for a closer look at the tools and the process as we go, visit nmlra.org.